Thank you for joining us again. This is Insight, and on Insight tonight, we are blessed to have four guests of serious, serious clout. Join us as we welcome them to discuss the state of the nation of Kenya and indeed the speech that the president gave a little bit earlier. To my left is the ambassador, Dr. Josephine Ojiambo, who is a research scientist at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Nairobi, as well as an adjunct professor at the School of Public Health at Kenyatta University. In addition, she works as a stakeholder management expert uh, of the Kenya National Innovation, or rather for the Kenya National Innovation Agency. Karibu sana. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you so much. Now, next to him, we have uh, a man who has two names. They say he was named so well, he needed to be named twice. Fuamba N.C. Fuamba. How are you? Fine, <laughs> Victor. Good to see you. He is a politician, Indeed. a political and governance analyst. And as well, some of you might actually recall him uh, once upon a time, one of the student leaders. Were you the president of the was university? The vice chairman of Sonu. Vice chairman of Sonu. Mm. You know, Many the great ago. Sonu. Yes. Once upon a time. Many years ago, yes. Indeed. <laughs> uh, Karibu sana. And of course, next to him is <laughs> Professor Noah Midamba. Karibusana. Asante. He is a professor of defense and foreign policy, and he's a former vice chancellor of KCA University, as well as a senior associate at the Global Center for Policy and Strategy. Karibusana. Karib. And last but not least, our representative from the clergy, you are Dr. Reverend, rather, Reverend Elias Otieno Agola. Karibusana. He is a long serving clergyman and he's the current chair of the Kenya National Council of Churches. He's, you've known him on our channel. He's outspoken over uh, issues in the society, issues of governance as well as leadership. He wears many hats, but today he's here to speak about the state of the nation. Karibusana. Asante sana, Victor. Thank you very much. And with that, shall we begin? Yeah. First of all, let me just get your impressions on uh, the speech that had some members of parliament shouting Igwe, Igwe at the end of it. <laughs> Dr. Ojambo, yes. is it Igwe for you or nay? I think it's Igwe. Definitely the president's third address on the state of the nation caught many by surprise. In fact, pulled the rug from under the feet of many of his critics. I want to say what really I saw that uh, I would call remarkable was a response from the women in parliament mm. when he spoke about the issues of toxic masculinity That's right. around the issues of gender-based violence and uh, his interventions or the government's interventions towards addressing violence. Mm. And those uh, stood out for you? Those stood out and for the women in the house, they got to their feet and shouted Igwe. We felt that presence. Yes. Thank you. We'll come back to that in a bit. Yes. What about you, Fomba? What stood out for you? President William Ruto, first of all, pointed out that uh, he expressed empathy for Kenyans who are struggling. But again, he also gave hope that our worst days are behind, days are getting better, and the future is very bright, based on the facts and uh, figures that he gave in his speech. All right. And again, something that is so critical is that if you are corrupt, you are on your own. And that's uh, the space that is supposed to be watched for the coming like, six months like he promised. So I think some heads are going to roll. Interesting, interesting. What about you, Professor? Uh, Victor, the biggest uh, um, enemies we have in the country are, are mainly two. One is corruption, and the other one is we're divided as a country. And the president touched on some very, very important key mm -hmm. issues which he need to uh, now affect as we move in the future. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. What about you, Reverend Agola? Wow. Um, the What's president, out for you? Yeah, I listened to the president talk to us as usual, uh, making very firm um, statements. And what stood out for me is that um, the president is starting to listen to other leaders. We've been mentioning the issues around here and there. And listening to him say, uh, I hereby direct that we cancel one of the, uh, you know, one of the contracts that he has he had signed two before. Much. Two of them mm -hmm. is a plus for him. Mm -hmm. What we are waiting for is to see whether he was that uh, genuine in his statement, uh, because saying it is one thing, and seeing it done. Is it's a completely another thing. Another thing. Yes. 
Mm. But, All right. but, but at least he's starting to listen to some of the issues we are raising. Uh, hopefully, he's going to listen to all of them. All right. Thank you. All right, all right. Now, Dr. Ojambo, the president outlined an ambitious plan for the universal health coverage through some transformative reforms. Uh, from your experience in, in public health, do you find the measures outlined, for example, Taifa care, do you find, uh, and digitization as well, and, as, and the others that he mentioned, do you find these measures a, accurate, I mean, um, adequate to address the systemic challenges and inefficiencies in uh, the healthcare sector? Well, they are practical. They have been tried elsewhere and they have worked in settings that are economically equal to or similar to ours. I think what we need to also take into cognizance is that we are transitioning from national health insurance to the social health insurance fund. So that transition is where we are now and we are in quotes, suffering the teething of the new social health insurance fund. I think like NHIF and other interventions put in place earlier to provide greater access to health services, the need for public participation cannot be underrated. If there was anything that we should do more of, it's public awareness. There were questions today about the new name, Taifa, Taifa care. care. And I think all we need to say is it's fundamental and it's about universal health coverage. Health coverage that's universal is global in terms of its understanding and its applicability. So there's nothing in what the president said that's impossible to do. What we need to do is make sure we carry Kenyans or, uh, with us when we articulate policies and that those in charge of policies are able to explain them properly. The Social Health uh, Authority takes care of three streams of funding and the head of state mentioned them very clearly a stream of funding around insurance, primary health care, and a third stream of funding on critical and chronic care. These need to be carefully addressed and enunciated so Kenyans understand what services they're going to get. The need to continue to pay the outstanding bills that were left by NHIF, mm -hmm. which really are the result of misalignment between cost of delivering care and what indeed was paid needs to be completed. Mm -hmm. And he did tell us that they paid, paid about 12 billion shillings recently and another 4 billion, I think, tomorrow. This needs to be completed so that service providers provide service mm -hmm. when patients go for care. By the way, um, on, on that matter, we, we had a, a number of um, um, union leaders uh, the other day in the studio. Mm -hmm. One of them from the private rural and urban private um, hospitals union, if, if I get it right, uh, bright young man, yes. uh, Lishenga, he said about 30% of private hospital uh, you know, service providers have actually gone bankrupt and about 70% are in financial distress mm -hmm. and a lot of them are not even able to, to provide basic things like gloves and, and gauze and, and, and cotton wool. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a big thing and I want us to come back to that in a second. But let me bring you in, um, Fomba. The president acknowledged public frustration over some unmet promises and, and, and certain hardships. As a governance expert, how would you assess this administration's record for transparency and accountability in addressing public concerns? Towards the end of uh, his speech, I think he mentioned uh, an analogy about him being a farmer. And he stated that a transformative uh, process is progressive. And so far, the challenges that have existed so far, demonstrated through the, through the speech, demonstrates that there is uh, room for improvement and a lot of good things are happening away from the usual political noise. You know, we have been so much drowned into usual political noise and forgotten about the good things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Therefore, based on his firm commitment, I believe that the promise that we are going to deal with the corrupt is going to work. Because when you go back to what uh, C.S. Mbadi said the other day, that we lose two billion shillings per day, that's something that had been mentioned by President Uhuru in the previous regime. Mm -hmm. And with the President's firm commitment, I'm very sure that if we take care of that corruption, if we deal with the corrupt properly, we'll be able to have a lot of uh, money around that will make uh, our lives much more comfortable. Earlier on, there was a criticism of this government about not being able to communicate properly in, in you know, the, some of the good things that uh, are happening. And there yes. appeared to be uh, a disconnect uh, between uh, that and, and the And ground. I think that still remains a very big problem because, you see, you can imagine if even these state departments just use social media alone 
to communicate whatever they are doing. For example, look at the progresses that have been made in the agricultural sector. All the 17 factories now operational. Yes. It has never happened, sugar factories. There are four, four of them under construction. Who is aware of that? Because the ministry has we not communicated that for the first for time. The first time. Okay. Does the president have to go and communicate everything that is happening in every state department or in every ministry? No. And, and again, when you come to something like the Adani deal, before the president or before the government got engaged into this Adani deal, there must have been some people in between who were assigned to do something called due diligence. How did they fail? Because even if they have been cancelled, all those people who have been reporting to work, to work on this project, have been earning taxpayers' money. So people have to be taken to be held responsible. The moment they are held responsible, it will be an example to many other people so that there's serious war against corruption that is going on. And that should be the beginning point, that cancelling the deals alone is not enough. Let us try to get to the bottom of the matter, to see who misled us get, to get into this kind of arrangement, when there are so many other institutions or other organisations that could as well do PPPs for us. And again, it's also a lesson that when we get engaged now to do the JKIA under another arrangement, let us do it properly, include public participation, let's have all stakeholders involved so that we make the right decisions and invest properly. If you were to say in a sentence, and I want you, uh, good, a good professor here, to jump in, what would you prescribe as the medicine to fix the government's communication problem, as you, as you call it? Have it more streamlined. Organize structures within uh, uh, small units, the way you organize a business, so that every state department has a proper communication uh, efforts. Because every civil servants are there who are assigned to do this job. But when you go to social media, that is more than form of communication everywhere. You cannot see that being communicated. Look at the progress that has been made through trying to seal corruption loopholes in digitization. For example, we are told that KAWIS alone has been able to make 43% uh, profit, more money than the previous year because of digitization. How come we do not have that communication from KWIS themselves? Exactly. People are sleeping on the job. More than ordinary civil servants believe that they are there to work, wait for the day to end, and close the day and earn their salary. Right. So that is something that must be dealt with so that there's discipline in our culture in terms of how we work. All right. Yeah. Uh, Professor, it looks like, you know, it's one of those questions, and I'm just uh, spinning it off the top of my head. Uh, if a tree has fallen in the forest and nobody has heard of it and nobody has seen it, has a tree fallen? <laughs> um. Victor, I, tonight I want to really focus on education and uh, foreign policy, but let me make just a quick uh, reference to this. We need a governors that work. Uh, Paul Kagame is building one of the finest universities uh, which is needed in Africa. Uh, they will focus on governors, uh, modern governors of the country. And so the president need to step back. Uh, he need to, uh, to focus on the big policy issues, the big message to the country, and make the people that he has appointed accountable, uh, particularly the CS. Uh, they need to be speaking to us. Uh, they need to be giving us progress report. We need to hear them uh, because most most of the, uh, the people he has appointed, people don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. They hear more of the president. And, and I know the president is a detail, uh, but it, it cannot afford to be a micromanager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he must step back. And then, then all those people need to be accountable. If they cannot do the job, there are other Kenyans who are qualified. All right. Uh, earlier this week, we had something of an uh, international incident, some, uh, an embarrassment. We had a, a, an opposition leader of one of our neighboring countries being abducted in this country. And I think within hours of a conversation around uh, uh, Kenya's foreign policy, mm -hmm. there were criticisms of uh, perhaps how we treat each other as the East African community. What would you have to say uh, to such an incident of, uh, you know, one Kiza Besije being snatched off, you know, just on the streets of Nairobi or in one of our estates? Well, several things and several ways to look at it. Please. One is we do have a policy. We do have a foreign policy and we do have pillars that guide their foreign policy, which was developed 
by Uhuru and Amina, Amina Muhammad. Uh, the president has just amended that policy. Uh, you cannot take a foreign policy uh, like a laundry. You know, you wash it, you know, so that all the colors are off. Uh, American foreign policy has stayed for 200 years. Uh, we just Consistent. Little, you must be. Uh, because how we deal with the U.S., how we deal with China, need to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And the point is, you're coming to East Africa, East Africa community, how we deal with each other. Uh, uh, the protocol, uh, follow the, uh, the law, uh, you know, as, as govern uh, the East Africa. And therefore, you cannot do what happened. You cannot... Uh, go and kidnap anybody from another state and, and then walk away with it and claim that uh, you know, it was kind of right or anything, or in collusion uh, be w with one of our senior people. It cannot and should not be accepted at all. All right. Now, um, in the president's speech, uh, he mentioned uh, some geopolitical challenges, including uh, some, you know, well-known global economic shocks. Would you care to tell us in brief, um, how well has Kenyan, uh, Kenya positioned herself diplomatically to navigate such issues and protect its economic interests? Um, Victor, allow me to just outline a few pillars, Please. you know, so that the, the public can understand. Please. The, we came up with the first, by the way, this is the first time uh, in uh, 20, uh, 2014, first time that Kenya had a written uh, pillar, a written foreign policy. Number one is peace and diplomacy. Number two is economic diplomacy. And number three, something I've been working on for a very long time, the diaspora policy. Uh, uh, w which was ingrained. Environmental, which is really uh, futuristic. And then we have cultural policy. The Ruto uh, uh, has changed some things, you know, so that uh, we need to settle down so we know what is it uh, uh, that they are talking about. That is something called digital diplomacy. And, and I think that digital diplomacy can be sort of woven within the bigger picture instead of separating it as itself as a police. So this is something we'll be talking about. Then it came with the global health uh, diplomacy, which, which I think is, is important, uh, but, but health need to be really woven, particularly domestic, mm -hmm. and then how international relation fit back. But otherwise, he remained uh, pretty much with the pillar. Uh, one of them is the climate, uh, what was called climate, uh, uh, was called uh, environmental, he changed it to climate, which is, which is fine. Uh, that economic policy remained. Uh, global peace and engagement is very critical, and uh, regional diplomacy is important. Now, let me say another thing. Kenya, when you look at the whole continent of Africa, is in a very enviable position. But we have more critics within Kenya itself who are beating up on, on Kenya image and everything. Is that so? No, no question about it. We are number seven uh, largest economy uh, in the continent of Africa. Uh, we are the most powerful country militarily in East and Central Africa. And then when you look at, uh, uh, today we were engaging with, the, with another issue which are, which are looking at startup, uh, startup companies. Uh, when you compare Rwanda and Tanzania, their start, startup is failing at 74%. Kenya is failing at 24%. You know, the, the, the hubs that we the have incubation in hub. incubation hub you have in Nairobi, the coffee, uh, you see that in Nairobi. Kenyans are ready to step forward and create those hubs. The reason is government people will not provide uh, resources for employment for everybody. But the private sector, if we boost the private sector, okay. we will be toward 
where Singapore is, and, and where South Korea is. All right. That's the, uh, the, 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 the That's goal. That's a goal. That's a we, target. No, we need to be. Uh, All right. We're talking about Vision 2030. Now, what uh -huh. is that Vision 2030? Uh -huh. And so, 2030 is not too far away? No, it's not too far. Now, uh, you've laid down some knowledge on us. I want uh, our people to digest that for a second, and we'll be right back oh. after this short break. And there's a gentleman who we need to hear from, the representative of the National Council of Churches, the Reverend Agola. Karibu sana, and please, we'll be right back. <laughs>